PCS members and friends to our today's IBS PCS seminar. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have with us today Professor Robert Alicki from University of Gdansk in Poland. And I would like to invite our scientific host, Dario, to introduce our speaker. Please, Dario. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. So, yeah, it's a great pleasure to have Robert today uh, as our speaker. So, um, let me introduce briefly his career. So, um, he spent most of his career, or the vast majority of his career, in Poland, actually, in uh, Gdansk University, where he entered in 1974 as an assistant, and then he did all the all the career, he passed it through assistant professor, associate professor, professor, and finally, finally full professor from 1994. In the meanwhile, he also received uh, several prestigious fellowships. Among those, probably the most well-known is the Humboldt Fellowship given in Germany. And um, he has been visiting professor in various universities, among them Leuven, Rome, Tor Vergata, Udine, Nottingham, Tokyo, and Perimeter Institute. Now, uh, Robert career is mostly, and Robert research is mostly devoted to various problems in quantum mechanics, quantum physics. For example, he has been, let's say, the, 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 the inventor or let's say the first developer of quantum batteries, a topic that here in ABS we care quite a lot, at least in my group. Uh, but today he's going to give a talk on uh, probably slightly different topics, a slightly different topic, active systems, a blind spot in physics. So Robert, I think you can start. Thank you very much for the invitation and nice words. Indeed, I would like to uh, present in very general terms. I'm not going to uh, uh, speak about details and uh, calculation of a kind of uh, field which was for us a, a surprise uh, when we started to deal with this. But this is connected with um, strongly with uh, what is called quantum thermodynamics. Maybe I begin with a sample of reference because it gives me also opportunity to introduce my uh, co-workers. So first of all, Alejandro Jenkins, who is now a long-term visiting professor at the University of Gdańsk. So we have opportunity to uh, work in, uh, directly at, on, on the topics at, uh, at the spot. Uh, the other co-worker is David Gelbasser Klimowski, who is uh, now a professor at Technion in Haifa. And recently, we also started a uh, collaboration with Elisabeth von Hout, who is a professor and director of the institute at the Fraunhofer Institute in Dresden. She's experimentally, so we hope very much that we could also bring these theoretical ideas to. Um, uh, so, physicists working with, with uh, say, real stuff, not only with a piece of paper. Uh, as you see from the title, it's looked like a quite uh, vast uh, um, topic. So uh, there are papers about uh, solar cells, uh, thermoelectric generators, uh, batteries, uh, theory of triboelectricities, so, uh, and also the problem of engines, which is the last paper that somehow summarized many of this, uh, of this uh, previous results. So one can ask a question, what was the motivation uh, to study such old fashioned uh, problems, which are considered by most of say theoretical physicists solved and completely uninteresting. Uh, so the motivation was uh, twofold. First comes from quantum th thermodynamics. And in fact, uh, a long time ago, I have written a paper on uh, quantum engines. The main reason of this paper, uh, result of this paper was that you need something like a macroscopic element in the, in the engine, which uh, has a dynamics, periodic or cyclic dynamics. And it's usually the, the, the most easiest way to describe this is to put it 
into uh, in the form of time dependent Hamiltonian. It's a kind of macroscopic perturbation of, of the quantum, uh, say, work uh, fluid. So this was, I remember that somehow it's a necessary ingredient of, um, of engine. And then much later, so around uh, 2011, 12, when I visited Weizmann Institute, I returned to the problem of quantum thermodynamics and try to apply these ideas to existing devices, not to some, uh, say, more abstract problems like engine based on the single qubit or single uh, harmonic oscillator, which were realized also in, in a lab, but to the system which exists you know, for a century or more. Um, and everybody assumes that the, the description is, is uh, uh, is well known. And then the, the, the problem started because uh, I realized that it's not the case. The existing uh, description and theories uh, simply they do not contain the, the fundamental elements which I believed were necessary to, 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 to have uh, operating engine. And the other source uh, was a, a paper of Alejandro Jenkins it is a radio paper uh, about the main, the, the main message from this paper is that engines are self oscillators, or in some cases are uh, not oscillators, but rather rotators. Now this difference is not uh, very important. And somehow it was a, a kind of coincidence that this the two ideas uh, met somehow, and we met personally and start collaboration. So what we realized uh, that what is missing in the existing theories, and we realized that in all these devices, which we would like to describe, uh, it is important that transport of mass, charge, or heat uh, against uh, gradients of external field of gravity, electrochemical potential, temperature, needs some active pumping. We cannot describe this in terms of some stationary uh, processes. And that this, uh, one need to develop a microscopic theory of pumping uh, for all these devices, uh, devices which I mentioned in the titles of, of the paper, but also to many more. So, I mean, this, this, this field of application of this idea grows and grows. So for us, it was also quite unexpected. So for example, it, it includes such uh, uh, devices or system like uh, electrochemical fuel, photovoltaic cells, thermoelectric and triboelectric generators, active ion channels in bio, bio, uh, biological systems, even the, syst uh, the system which are considered in astrophysics, like the problem of heating of stellar corona. We also believe that uh, these ideas can find applications in theory of turbulence, or generation of shock waves, and many, many others. And of course, there's a well-known phenomenon. So the question is how they are described in uh, the textbooks and uh, in uh, scientific papers, it sh should be everything should be uh, here well uh, known without uh, any new ideas. And the most striking example is uh, um, thermoelectric uh, effect. So it is usually described by linear thermodynamics of Onzager. And in fact, this uh, Onzager thermodynamics was created to, to describe thermoelectric effect. But we realized that neither uh, Onzager's linear thermodynamics nor its extension by Prigoz into a uh, nonlinear system, uh, they are always based on currents and thermod thermodynamic potential. So currents driven by gradients of thermodynamic potential. And this simply cannot explain this, what we call active pumping, which is what is the main Mm, ingredient of, uh, of active system. 
active transport. So how to uh, distinguish between passive and active system in, in our sense? Of course, this is a certain setting and, uh, which, which we are, the, the, the names can be met in other fields also, but here we uh, mean something very uh, specific. So uh, this uh, picture uh, above describes the passive system. So we, we simply have a, in an environment, we have uh, motion of some working fluid from the place where the, uh, it has a higher free energy to the place with low free energy. And on the way, this um, energy, this potential energy, in a sense, can be used, uh, you know, we have load here. It can be simply dissipated to heat something, but it can be used also for some more um, uh, non-trivial uh, purposes. But the main uh, feature is uh, that this is essentially a motion with some friction corresponding to this load along down the gradient of free energy um, thermodynamic uh, potential. And active system, all the system which were mentioned in, uh, in the list of, of, of papers are different. You, you observe the circulation of the working fluid in some uh, circuit, external circuit. So to drive the circulation, which is described by some uh, kind of non-conservative force. So it cannot be, the circulation cannot be caused by the force, which is a gradient of a potential. So it must be um, driven by some pump, which is on the other side driven by, by engine. Here I uh, drove this in the form of turbine and then the kind of pump, which is similar, but it can be also instead of turbine and can be uh, also a piston, oscillating piston. Also this pump could be a, a piston pump. It, and this is the case in most of the systems. So you see that characteristic feature of active system is this present of circulation. In the case of system which produce electric uh, power, it's of course uh, electromotive force. So I uh, concentrate for a while on the notion of electromotive force. Because when we started to read literature, it appeared to us that this notion created in the past and still creates many confusions. So it's really quite difficult to find a, a good definition what is really electromotive force. And there was a problem discussed in the end of uh, 19th century by, by outstanding physicists and chemists, but then the, the physics and chemists developed so much into different, uh, different direction that somehow this problem is forgotten. Uh, the other source of confusion is that in some sense, in practice, this electromotive force is measured in a simple way. It's identified with the electric potential difference between the terminals of the device which produce this electromotive uh, force. Moreover, the, the, this electromotive force is typically equal to some natural electrostatic potential difference which appears in this device. So it was in some sense natural to create very simple theory which connects electromotive force with the difference of potential somewhere in the in the, in the devices. But this is not the case. The electromotive force is something different. And uh, the best way is to use some, some concrete example. And I will present uh, the, the uh, comparison between capacitors and active devices like batteries, so it means electrochemical cells, photovoltaic, thermoelectrical, fuel cells. All these cells, they uh, they are active devices. So this is what we believe, while capacitors are passive devices. I will come to this uh, in a moment. Uh, 
searching and uh, said that literature, Alejandro discovered that there was a physicist who uh, understood this problem of, of definition of electromotive, uh, electromotive force and even proposed to use a different term, electromotive pump, somehow to describe any underlying physical mechanism that promotes the circulation of electric current around a closed path. Uh, and the circulation must be driven by non-conservative active force. So it seems that it's the best definition somehow of electromotive, uh, electromotive force in comparison to, 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 to usual uh, potential difference. It's, it's a mechanism which promotes circulation. So this is, this is really the main difference. Okay, so now the promised examples. You have two types of de uh, devices. Uh, at the top, we have a super capacitor. And at the bottom, we have a battery. From the physical point of view, that they look quite similar. There are two electrodes, and there is uh, electrolyte in between. But the first one, is essentially uh, a system of two capacitors uh, connected uh, in a series. You have first capacitor, which is formed by the double layer. So one of this layer is, is uh, in electrode, the other is formed by ions uh, of the electrolyte. And then there is another uh, capacitor. Uh, these uh, double uh, layers are created during the charging pro processes. So when we charge such a capacitor, then this, uh, the, the charge uh, increases and forms this, this, this uh, two, two capacitors. And when you attach a load, say in the form of a resistance, you see that the current flows through the external circuits, but doesn't flow through the device. You see that there is a current between these two capacitors because they are connected in seri series. It must be um, uh, current between them, but there is no current inside of the capacitor. Simply these two uh, electrostatic layers uh, uh, are dissolved. In, uh, so the, the charge is um, discharged and uh, the current flows through the external uh, circuit up to the moment of complete dis discharge. The battery in the uh, bottom is completely different. You see that here, the current flows also inside of these two uh, capacitors. So these capacitors are uh, created spontaneously because of some chemical reaction which happens uh, here and the current goes through capacitors uh, also so we have a full uh, cycle yes we have really current flowing in the closed uh, uh, circuit so we see that we need a, a pumping because the small arrows they describe the current flowing against the gradient of electrostatic potential. So here, active forces should appear between these uh, two layers for each uh, capacitor. We have also a difference in the curve describing uh, dependence of the voltage uh, on the extracted uh, charge. Okay, this extracted charge can be also replaced by time, as you can think about uh, time development. So for the case of the cap uh, capacitor, the uh, voltage decreases uh, linearly. So, so capacitor is simply discharged. But in the case of battery, it works at uh, the constant uh, voltage up to the moment when somehow the, the fuel of this battery, which, which is this chemical um, uh, electrolyte plus the, the uh, um, uh, electrolytes, uh, uh, um, uh, till the moment when 
this uh, fuel for the battery runs out and then uh, the potential drops immediately. Okay, so we have two differences. It's, it's different time dependence of, of the potential and the fact that only in the case of battery, we have uh, a closed uh, circuit. So, so, so electric current uh, flows in a closed uh, circuit. So the problem is how to uh, describe this uh, pumping mechanism. For the case of the batteries, you, you cannot find in the literature any dynamical explanation of what drives uh, this uh, current against electrostatic potential. When we switch to photovoltaic cell, cell you can get many explanations. And the most popular is presented here on this uh, slide. So most textbooks and papers, you, you can find such a picture. But Photovoltaic cells uh, consist of uh, the junction of two semiconductors, one of N-type, the other of uh, P-type. And then because of this uh, difference of uh, um, free charge, uh, free electrons densities in both um, materials, there is a created what is called uh, bound bending. So it means that energy of the electron depends on the position and somehow on the right hand side, this energy is higher. And then the, there is a kind of force which drives the electron to the left. The opposite situation is in the case of holes. And now we switch light and uh, the photons excite produce a pair of electron hole, sometimes called exciton. And then these two separated charges, they follow down the potential given by this bending of uh, conduction uh, band. And this produces the concentrations as electrons of the uh, left uh, electrode. Uh, the holes on the right electrons. And this is supposed to create also the current in the external um, uh, circuit. Of course, it's amazing, but on the first side, one should notice that it cannot be the, the, the correct explanation because this is a completely static situation and the driving force is a potential force. No potential, can, uh, static potential, can drive electric current in the closed circuit. It's against the fundamental uh, theorem of calculus. Also, if you replace uh, electrostatic potential by chemical potential, as some authors did, it doesn't help. It's also a potential. So potential cannot drive uh, electric current in the closed, uh, in the closed circuit. So something must be wrong. So let's discuss this in more detail. So the first sentence I already explained. This is simply against the, the basic uh, theorem of the calculus. If you have uh, force given by, by um, gradient of potential, you, you cannot produce this uh, motion in the close, uh, close uh, circuit. There is also some faulty description, uh, namely the idea of uh, band bend, the interface, it doesn't make any sense because bands, energy bands are simply energy levels of the effective single electron Hamiltonian. And energy levels are independent of the position. When you put together these two materials that you have a single Hamiltonian describing the electrons in the whole in the whole sample. And this uh, solving the Schrodinger equation, you get levels which are independent of the position. It doesn't make sense to, to make uh, energy levels position dependent. What is position dependent are eigenfunctions, of course, because this is not a uniform material. 
uh, it has different properties on the right uh, left hand side. So the wave function of this uh, single uh, eigenfunction of the single electron effective Hamiltonian depend on the position. And then it causes that you have varying local charge distribution and also varying electrostatic and chemical potential. So what can be position dependent, it is electrostatic and chemical potential and not uh, energy levels. So I, you know, this picture of energy band, um, bands bending is, is present in many publications in textbooks. Moreover, if, as you see in the moment on, on the other picture, at equilibrium, this variation of electrostatic and chemical poten potential, they completely cancel and produce a constant electrochemical potential. So, so at this kind of equilibrium, you cannot have a, a current at all. Okay, so this is the picture. Uh, this is an important uh, picture because this physical phenomena which, which, which appears here are very often completely disregarded in some models, especially microscopic models of uh, thermoelectric effect or uh, photovoltaic effect. So now there are quite many papers describing this effect for the case of small system like quantum dots or, or uh, Josephson junction, uh, uh, the really microscopic system. And everywhere when you see uh, the construction of the model, this fundamental effect which I would like to describe is, is missing. So what happened when you could put two materials, for example, pieces of two metals or uh, two semiconductors with, with different uh, density of electrons together. So we assume that there are different uh, chemical potential for the electron and on the uh, left, uh, the chemical potential is higher. What happened when, uh, uh, when does, uh, such systems are in contact and the electrons can uh, tunnel between two? Uh, subsystem. So immediately they go from a high uh, chemical potential uh, to lower chemical potential and form electrostatic double layer. So some electrons move to the right, leaving a positive charge on the left uh, hand side uh, of the junction. And then it forms an electrostatic double layer, uh, layer with appropriate jump of the electrostatic potential. So, and then we reach a kind of electrostatic equilibrium. So uh, it is described in the picture in the middle. So you see what uh, uh, first uh, you have um, uh, chemical potential, which is uh, given by mu A on the left hand side and by mu B on the right hand side. So that they must be the change in uh, at the junction of this uh, chemical potential from high to low. And this is fully compensated by the increase of electrostatic potential. So after a while, this system reached equilibrium. And because electrochemical potential was the sum of electrostatic and chemical potential, it's the, the driving, its gradient is a driving force for the charges then you have a completely flat electrochemical uh, potential because these two chemical and electrostatic potential are compensated. So you cannot get any mm. electromotic force by putting together two materials with different uh, chemical potential. Okay, how can you get electromotive force? You have to destroy this uh, equilibration process you have uh, to pull back the electrons from uh, right side uh, back to the left uh, simple, uh, sample. So you, you need a pump which effectively decreases the jump in electrostatic potential because it reduces, in the extreme case, to zero uh, this double layer. And this pumping, somehow produce electromotive force because now the 
uh, chemical potential do not compensate uh, anymore. And this uncompensated part of electrochemical potential form this electromotive force. And indeed charges, electrons goes from right-hand side to left-hand side, and then from higher potential back uh, in the external circuit uh, flew through the whole system. So the uh, first message is that you need a pump, you need some action. Uh, to destroy this, uh, this equilibrium. And the other message is that you cannot get a higher uh, voltage uh, than the difference of the chemical potential between these two materials. So this is what is observed, you know, that the maximal electromotive force is, is equal to some difference of, of, of some chemical potential in, in um, such uh, devices. Okay, so now the question, how to describe the, the, the pump? And first, okay, I would like to, to discuss first, maybe in simple words, this operation principle, how such system of engine and pump can work. In these devices I am interested in, not in say, uh, I do not, uh, there's, there's no problem with describing say, the steam engine which uh, drives uh, um, electric generator. There is a problem with this hidden engines and hidden pumps in this system which, which we consider. So first of all, there is always the similar mechanism of uh, boundary between two phases. In the case of uh, batteries and uh, photovoltaic devices and for others, there is an electrostatic double layer, which is formed at the contact between some two uh, materials. In the case of photovoltaic, it's uh, PN junction. In the case of batteries, electrolyte electrode interface. So then when you have this boundary, which is a kind of macroscopic degrees of freedom, this boundary, which is kind of say equilibrium state of matter, can oscillate around this uh, equilibrium. There are usually the dominating frequency. Sometimes in some models there, there, is, there are few frequencies of oscillation, few modes um, of oscillation, but this is this, this oscillator at the boundary forms what we call oscillating piston. It's this mechanical, essentially macroscopic device, which will be used to pump uh, charge fluid of electrons. So, uh, of course, the spontaneous oscillation of this piston uh, decays quickly and uh, we need some external supply of energy. It can be light, it can be heat, can be chemical energy, which supplies energy uh, to uh, maintain this oscillation. But of course, such uh, maintaining oscillation is, is uh, not a, a simple, task, you need a feedback mechanism, a proper feedback uh, mechanism, uh, which controls the uh, supply of energy. Mm, uh, and this, this control depends on, on the state of this, of this piston, depends on the position of this piston. What is nice in all these devi devices that are very economical, the same piston, the same microscopic degree of freedom which self oscillates can be used to pump this uh, fluid producing this uh, kind of non-conservative uh, force. So we have a real pump uh, which uh, finally produces a constant pressure far away from the junction. So we may not see that this is a really oscillating object uh, inside of the device because it's like with uh, water supply in our house, where we open a tap in, in the bathroom, we do not uh, see the oscillation of the pump somehow, somehow far away from, from our house. We observe a constant pressure. So this is the, the same mechanism, this kind of um, hydrodynamic mechanism, uh, valid for fluids, uh, this, this uh, um, uh, periodic 
oscillation finally produces essentially constant pressure, which is in the case of electric devices is a uh, is a potential difference. It's electromotic force uh, essentially. Okay, so maybe now to bring it closer to our imagination, I would uh, consider simple models, fully classical models, but okay, quantum quantum system will come uh, uh, soon. Okay, so first is the model which we called put put boat uh, steam engine because it's, there is a kind of toy called put put boat which uh, which use this engine to to propel this uh, this boat. It's a container which cons uh, contains liquid water and steam with air, and there is a source of heat, and. Uh, we have also uh, the pump part. So this is engine part and we have also the pump, which is used here to transport uh, water from lower uh, reservoir to the upper reservoir. But of course we can close this, uh, this, car, uh, the, the circuit, water circuit and, and have a um, circulation of, of water. But okay, it's easy to describe like this. And, one can check it experimentally by such a uh, toy uh, boat that indeed the boundary between uh, gas and uh, liquid oscillates and the energy is provided by, by this flame. So we have the uh, high temperature reservoir and uh, uh, the cold tank uh, is a low temperature reservoir and you obtain steam engine with oscillating uh, piston. Another system, we devoted a whole paper to this uh, system, it's electromechanical. Again, the uh, mechanical uh, part uh, is a capacitor which uh, the distance between place is the dynamical variable. So it's some of elastic material uh, between this uh, two plates of um, capacitor and this capacitor can oscillate and this oscillations are driven by external uh, source of voltage. But you see to get this oscillation, we need a feedback. This feedback is provided by the rather obvious dependence of the capacity on the, on the distance and less uh, trivial dependence of the internal resistance, which is presented here on the distance. One can add also the, the dependence of the um, external resistance of the distance, but it's not necessary. So such a device again, produce self oscillations. And one can describe both the device and also many other, including uh, solar cells by a quite simple model. On this level of this classical level of description is very simple model, which externally, which essentially uh, contains two elements. One is a uh, damp harmonic oscillator, which represents this mechanical degree of freedom, which you call piston. And it's also uh, driven by some external force, which is kind of a pressure acting on, on, on this uh, boundary, which depends on the number of some excitation. They can be uh, uh, they, they, they can be excitons in the solar cell. Uh, they can be the molecules of uh, steam in the case of steam engines. So there, there are always uh, two elements, the uh, um, mechanical one, the piston, and then the kinetic equation for the number of these excitons. And this is a typical kinetic equation when we have uh, recombination rate and we have production rate. And what is important, we need a feedback. So this two rates, or, or at least one of them, should depend on the position of the piston. And that is quite simple the condition for the self-oscillation of this value where if this inequality satisfies or this feedback has a proper sign, in a sense, we obtain a self-oscillation of the system. Okay, so now a few remarks. So this kind of 
classical macroscopic description of self oscillating piston, similar as we can do it for self rotating turbines in terms of deterministic uh, equation, it's essentially a three dimensional uh, autonomous uh, dynamic system is simple. Uh, the, the theory of pumping is more difficult uh, even in the case of, of the usual water pumps. So there's no much theoretical work of this, but we can, okay, intuitionally imagine that such a piston can pump uh, fluid. To make it more realistic and more complicated, we can add thermal noise and external load. Because uh, as I said, pumping is difficult, so we can mimic this by some kind of external uh, load. And then one can, instead of deterministic description, we can go to master equation, Fokker-Planck equation for, for engine uh, part. And this is more complicated, but it's doable. It's, it's described in, in the last papers I, I quoted in the uh, beginning. In quantum domain, it's more complicated. I would say that till now, we do not have a complete and thermodynamically consistent description of quantum autonomous uh, engine with load. It's still a basic. So this point two and three, if it, it's a certain moment we'll get such models, uh, we have, uh, we will meet, we'll meet a problem. Uh, then there is a kind of uh, paradoxical uh, situation. It's very easy to see uh, self oscillations on the level of deterministic dynamical system because simply we have transition from a fixed point to limit cycle or some even um, chaotic uh, trajectory, but you immediately see that something is going on. In the case of, uh, of system with noise described in terms of probability distribution, we finally get a kind of stationary probability distribution in classical case, we know how to do it in quantum, it's still an open problems. But the question is how somehow to extract from the stationary states that uh, the system is really in, in the self oscillating regime. So it, it's not so obvious. And I think it's one of the problems we are also thinking uh, how to solve, how to distinguish on this statistical level of description uh, passive system from active system by some simple uh, procedure. Okay, so now at, at the very end, example of chemical engine with quantum system to illustrate a bit where is the problem with, with quantum system. Well, so we consider chemical reaction, symbolic chemical reaction, uh, in which we have to involve also some, some piston, some uh, say macroscopic degrees of freedom, which is described as harmonic oscillator. So, so what are the physical models uh, for this additional uh, uh, harmonic oscillator? So it should be, for example, a model for uh, uh, oscillator corresponding to a, a single mode uh, in the case of chemical laser, when we consider such a simplified model of one uh, mode laser, uh, we can consider this, uh, this one mode as oscillator uh, coupled to, to some uh, chemical reaction. Uh, the other is, uh, example is connected with this uh, solar self. We can think about plasmonic uh, um, oscillations. And this, this plasmon can be represented by, by, by harmonic oscillator. Uh, this can work for fuel cells, biological engine, it can be applicable also to, to batteries in some sense. Now, I will not go into details, but what is interesting when you write down the master equation, you can now describe this um, oscillator as an open system, uh, describe this uh, chemical reservoirs by Hamiltonian, introduce a great canonical ensemble for this chemical bus, and then we have also the, the condition for the interaction part. So in the interaction part, we have <coughs> bus operators, which is, uh, describe this, this chemical reaction. They annihilate R, annihilate A, B, and create C. So therefore, the, the, there must be some relation between R and uh, operators describing the, uh, the number of, of molecules. 
So this relation is essentially, it, it describes the type of chemical reaction. And when we derive the Markov and Master equation, we see that we get pump and dump harmonic oscillator. And if this reaction is spontaneous, then this parameter, which appears in the ratio of uh, pumping and dumping phenomena can be negative. And therefore this ratio is, is larger than one and it describes the, the situation what is the laser theory is called laser action. So the energy of, of the oscillator grows exponentially uh, in time. And we can represent, I will not uh, go into details, uh, the evolution of this piston uh, at the following picture. It starts with some coherent state, this initial state, and then uh, the radius, uh, mm, uh, increases in time exponentially. So, so we mean, so we somehow see uh, that this piston uh, energy is increased, but this is not mainly heat, it's mainly work, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, which contained, uh, which is the main ingredient of this energy. It's work is stored in this piston. And, and this work can be computed uh, now comparing the energy of the actual state with the energy uh, of the passive uh, state was uh, obtained by some, some unitary uh, transformation. So we see that this work content of this uh, piston grows exponentially with time. And this is the main problem. It's difficult to stabilize the system. It's difficult to describe load in a consistent way. And this is why I am saying that it's still uh, problematic to, to have a fully autonomous uh, model of quantum engine. So now concluding uh, a, remark, a remark. So active system cannot be described by stationary processes where, where we, everything, uh, the motion is governed by the gradient of potential. So the Onsager theory cannot describe the, the generation of work in, in this uh, old devices I was uh, discussing. So we need the presence of time-dependent non-conservative forces. Uh, such active system can be treated as pumps propelled by head or chemical engines. And these engines are driven by, by the energy from non-equilibrium environment. Uh, already I told it, but these systems which present in nature are constructed by uh, by people are very economical. So this piston, uh, the same piston is used to extract the uh, work from, uh, from environment. Uh, and the same piston also pumps uh, this uh, fuel, uh, this, uh, not fuel, uh, the, uh, this fluid, um, charge fluid uh, producing circulating uh, uh, car. And what we notice that we need such a type of explanation for many examples of energy transaction, uh, tran trans transduction in, in, in bi biological system, chemical catalysis, and even for such exotic phenomena like current oscillation in Josephson junctions, fountain effect in super liquid helium, particle acceleration in plasmas, so even ascent of sub in trees. Of course, we do not work on all this system. There, is, there are some plans to do it, but it seems that it's a very vast field of, of, of research, which is, I would say, it's still interesting and, and challenging. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Alitsky, for this very interesting seminar. Let us thank our speaker. And uh, we have time for questions. Uh, I see Dario already raised his hand. Yeah, actually, I, I was I wanted to clap, but I made a mistake. So, uh, <laughs> so maybe I can ask. Uh, I mean, I can start with with a simple question. For example, I mean, in the standard, let's say auto engines or this kind of engines that we study in in quantum thermodynamics. I mean, I I, I I'm failing to get where 
this, uh, this theory that you are developing, where should I enter and how we should modify the, let's say, the, the theory to include this? Okay, as far as I know, for uh, I don't know if you speak about the same models, but usually there are the stroke engines, yeah? So yes. there is simple, there are not autonomous uh, models typically. There, there, you have a time dependent the Hamiltonian in a sense, because you switch right. a stroke to another. So this is the, 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 the case which, okay, it's similar to this, what I studied in 79, when instead of self-oscillating uh, piston, we have this piston driven by external uh, force. And then we have to calculate if this driving can extract work from, from the engine. Yes, if it can extract work, then we can argue that of course this work can be used to uh, to support this, this, this external oscillation. But to get a, a full picture, we need a, somehow a self-consistent uh, autonomous models. We, we cannot uh, add uh, this time dependence by hand, yes? by, by changing the strokes from one to another. So this is- I see. Okay, so let's say what you are doing now is to get let's say a microscopical description of this time dependent part of, of the stroke. Yeah, so right? time dependent time, because we know that fundamentally okay. all Hamiltonians are time uh, independent. The time dependent of trick to replace a part of, of the system by some classical system, yes, which, which has its own I dynamics, see. which is not influenced by, by, by the rest. It's, it's, it's a kind of big simplification. I see. Okay. Okay. Yes, sometimes, is... but it's not the, the, the whole answer to the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that is clear. Okay. Uh, then uh, Varinder has a question. Okay. Hi, Professor. Thanks for the nice talk. Okay. So, so my question is like that. You said that this, uh, like uh, on Sagar's description or uh, Prigozhin's. Uh, formalism they cannot be like uh, applied to thermoelectrics but there are like flurry of papers on thermoelectrics in which uh, like people have applied this theory and yeah. usually all the results are consistent with the uh, like thermodynamics so where is the gap the problem is they do not describe uh, uh, the origin of of what drives uh, the current they, they give a, a right answer for for the uh, voltage, but this is what I somehow explained why this uh, answer is correct yeah. because, you know, this pump can produce electromotive force which is bounded at the best by this difference of electrochemical potential. And this is, is no somehow, if you have two materials in, uh, in this thermoelectric junction, you know this difference. And from this, you can uh, say what could be the, the highest uh, uh, potential difference. But you do not have from uh, Onzager relation the mechanism. So what is the force which which drive the uh, the electric uh, uh, current? So this is this is the problem. That is, uh, it's a kind of guess, you know. That's uh, yeah. how you know, from phen phenomenology that the people discovered that these two parameters coincide somehow. The maximal Volt, this open circuit voltage and the difference uh, of uh, electrochemical potential, but there is no explanation. You know, the, the, the usual explanation is like, <laughs> it's completely wrong. Is that because of the difference of chemical potential, current is driven, but it's not driven. You see on this picture, it's immediately stopped after the double layer is uh, mm -hmm. formed. There is no force to, 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 to drive uh, anymore any current in, in the system. Okay. So, Professor, another comment is like that uh, in case of thermoelectric heat engines, whatever people have done, so they use the formalism of linear irreversible thermodynamics, which is usually should be valid for like uh, as a close to the equilibrium. But people also use this formalism to define far from equilibrium situations. So, what is your point of view about that? No, I mean, this is not the, the problem because, I mean, they assume linearity, which is of course uh, correct uh, on a close to equilibrium. But uh, the, the problem is that it's fundamental. That it models they do not describe any mechanism. It's it's like you know, 
to compare with Samsung. You have a steam engine in a black, in the black box, and from general uh, laws of thermodynamics, you can, for example, compute uh, Carnot uh, efficiency. You can also estimate uh, losses and things like that. You can say quite a lot about uh, the steam engine, but to explain how this engine works, you need to know its construction. You need to know that there is a piston, that there is a wheel, how it is called, yeah. the wheel, that there are valves which have to be open in the right moment. If you do not know this mechanism, how they work, you would not build for yourself any, uh, any heat engine. The same is here. You can get some uh, physically reasonable uh, results which agree with uh, experiments because of general laws of conservation of energy. You can also use somehow a second law also to this. And you can phenomenologically adding some parameters, you can reproduce um, experimental, some experimental result, but you cannot describe the mechanism. You do not have this piston, uh, this uh, flywheels, this uh, valves from uh, uh, from Onzager theory. It's not in our generalization, it's the same, it's no difference. Okay, and Professor, in like your entropy paper in which you summarized all of your these uh, recent research. Uh, so the thing is that you have said that we always need a mechanical of degree, mechanical degree of freedom for the, this tool uh, in order to extract some work and how it will link yes. with the load. But what about like these kind of heat engines, like laser heat engines in which we like extract work by stimulated emission of light. So there is no mechanical degree of freedom. So do they fit into in the laser? Common? In laser, there is a mechanical degree of freedom, <laughs> the size of coherent light. So this is oscillator. Because yes. you have a high population, then you can say yeah. it's semi-classical. And very often yeah. a laser field is replaced even by external uh, electric uh, wave simply, yes, by, by yes. Yes. Uh, periodic. Uh, periodic yeah. uh, electric field. This is why, the, because laser field is in some sense macroscopic. So this is this oscillator, laser uh, emitted laser uh, radiation. But uh, I understand it is microscopic, but uh, macroscopic. But can you say it is like also mechanical? Okay, the word mechanical. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I, maybe I wouldn't call it mechanical. Yes, okay. Uh, what is more important that I use the word mechanical because in most cases it is, but I okay. use also word uh, semi-classical okay. I would say uh, the most general, which is in all the cases would be the you need a semi-classical degree of freedom. Okay. This is the mo most, I think, general and clear uh, situations. So, so okay. somehow in, uh, also in the phonon you would call it mechanical, yes, but photon not so much, yes. Okay, so. On the other hand, you have a macroscopic electric field uh, and radio antenna produce essentially a classical macroscopic field. So it's not so far from, from, from mechanical in the sense that this is semi-classical. Okay, so, uh, so uh, Professor, other is a comment, not a question, but like, as you said, from fundamental theorem of calculus, you can uh, check that like uh, two conservative like gradient between two, con like this uh, conservative forces or like gradient between two like potentials, you cannot drive uh, any kind of work from it. So mm -hmm. it seems like a simple fact, then why people keep on working or keep on explaining things in this way? Because it seems like very basic fact. Yes, it is even not this one of the uh, of the very big uh, uh, so uh, shot in in this field, uh, uh, but he replaced electrostatic by ele uh, by chemical potential. So it's difficult to say. I, I would say that this is a rather topic for uh, soci sociology of science or psychology of science. Okay. Somehow, when something works in practice, people stop to, uh, to think about fundamental uh, descriptions. We have solar cells, we, we have batteries, 
what okay. do we need more? Most people say, but for theoretical physicists, I think to understand how things work is, is, is the most important. So this is why it's different. And okay. for years, I think the other, this is psychological problem. These topics were boring. Yes, there were so many interesting things in uh, quantum field theory, in particle mm -hmm. physics, in gravity. Who could care about how the, the, the battery works? Okay. This is my so, explanation, yes, but I don't know. <laughs> so, Professor, the question is like from your explanation, it looks like that even quantum heat engines need something classical. So can we see with something semi-classical? Yes, semi-classical. So classical. can we see quantum means quantum? This is, yeah. this is even a deeper problem to define work. I would say one needs something which is semi-classical, because work is not well defined on purely quantum level. It reminds me the problem of measurement. If you want to get rid of circular reasoning and going to larger and larger devices which measure something. At certain moment, you have to introduce the system you treat classically to, you know, to, 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 to solve the problem of measurement. My guess is that there is something similar, that, that, that this uh, notion of uh, work is a kind of uh, limiting notion. You need a kind of transition to semi-classical limit to define this, this problem. Okay. So the means, quantum means, level it has some 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 margin of 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 you know. So we can say like this: quantum is not fully quantum. You need at some level you need semi-classical description. It looks like this. I I, I still I am a bit confused, and I would like a fully quantum description, but it there are always some kind of obstacles in measurement theory and also in what we call quantum thermodynamics with the definition of fundamental. Actually, uh, even in, like you can see in quantum mechanics book by Landau, so volume three of his famous theoretical physics course, he discusses the same thing that even in, even in order to describe quantum measurements, you need some kind of classical device. It looks that this is the case. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so well, that's all I have. Okay, uh, and uh, we have also questions of, or comments from Sergey. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm still puzzled a little bit by the puzzle, so to say. So trying to grasp uh, what the real problem is, although I, I probably catch part of it. So let me try to understand. So there are no issues. Are there any issues on the purely classical description, on a purely classical level? Uh, it, okay. Yeah. What do you mean by issues? Because the main issues is the issues. No, look, look, look. You you presented an issue. You said, look, we have to understand here how we can do the self oscillations. And, okay, so uh, in the uh, sense, uh, transition if, from classical to to if, to if, if we add if we add only constant uh, fields, then uh, we cannot uh, produce any work and so on and so forth. Is this something which is a problem on the quantum level, or you see the same also on the purely classical? No, this is the same on the classical and quantum level. Good. So now, good. So let's maybe then talk first classical, just to to sort uh, a few examples which came to my mind and, and see mm -hmm. how how they uh, how where you will put them. Let's say I take a you know whatever one dimensional chain of coupled uh, oscillators doesn't matter mechanical whatever they are, and uh, I write down a Hamiltonian for this thing and then I add at the ends. Uh, to my equations of motion, this is not a Hamiltonian anymore. I will add some some uh, heat bath, which means there will be some forces which are characterized by some. Um, we have some uh, some spectral properties, and there is some. Um, we can probably describe them by some um, by some you know, uh, temperature and chemical potential and whatever. And then, in principle, if I uh, create a um, a disbalance if I create, um, a, 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 so to say, a gradient, if you wish, or a difference in these uh, parameters on the left and right hand side of my Hamiltonian system, I will generate uh, an energy and maybe particle flow, whatever else can flow through that system will flow. So, so that's a stationary thing. So where is this uh, uh, contradicting uh, your statements uh, you, you made? So what am I doing wrong here? Or what, what is it? No, you do not do anything wrong. It's a model right. of 
good con conduction, but it's not energy. Yes. It doesn't produce work. It no, but it has only. But in some sense, it seems to me only to have static input. So there is nothing driving. I'm, I'm not driving anything. I'm just putting. Of course, I'm putting these two different thermostats at the edges. So, so. Okay, so uh, this is the, the the passive system. What I presented here. Right. That is a passive system, and that's uh -huh, and that's not a problem. That's it's that's not okay. a problem. The problem is how to explain the circulation of something. It could be elect. Uh, 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 could be fluid, it could be uh, charged, yes? Uh, fluid. Okay, okay. The but then we, have, for instance, then we have, for instance, the, the example of the, I think you mentioned also the AC Josephson effect, uh, yes. which, which is in some sense even uh, uh, an experimental result, of course, also on the, on the quantum level, but you could also treat it purely classically, the mm -hmm. limit effects and so on. And okay, so that would be an example of of uh, of creating an active system, so to say. An active system because uh, Josephson junction oscillates and produces radiation. For example, coherent radiation uh, uh, and also coherent no, uh, uh, coherent uh, acoustic. Uh, yeah, out of out of some DC, in some sense, out of a DC. Uh, field which is applied to it, I think. Yes, it's, a, it's applied it's external uh, external driving uh, DC uh, field, and, and this it's it's a bit like like this uh, self oscillator here. This you have right. field, and then this uh, capacitor oscillate and produce electromagnetic right. radiation. So now, so now let's assume we understand this Josephson effect. So then, where is uh, so so what what is maybe I then I, I fail to understand what the open issues are. Okay, <laughs> so this is our, one of the last topics. We are, we should uh, write soon a paper uh, on this. Again, when we went through the literature, we noticed that what is used as a standard description, this kind of Kirchhoff equations, it's again senseless, completely senseless. It's, it's reproduced some results, but not all. And uh, we have a very nice equation, in fact, which are uh, based on the model a bit similar to what, what is here, this electric uh, capacitor, but it's fully, it's quantum, it's, it's fully quantum, which really describes the mechanism in, in terms of open system coupled to non-equilibrium uh, uh, reservoir to this external driving. It really reproduce very nicely uh, the voltage uh, and uh, voltage current curve and and produce uh, self oscillations, which are not uh, really so uh, so described by by, by existing models, but this uh, circuit models you can find in the literature. There is a kind of hand waving, which is which is far from being uh, convincing. But again, people are used. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so, so, am, am I understanding correctly that you are, you say that you want to do you want now to take? Um, Okay, also, I guess you, the circuit model for the Josephson junction, uh, uh, for the Josephson problem, I guess which you refer to is a classical problem. And yes. you want to take it quantum and that's the issue. So yes, say. we have it quantum and in the spirit of uh, quantum open systems and, oh. and we have some master equation and then, but this equation, uh, they are quantum, but this is, in some sense, semi-classical because yeah, 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 no, no. But I think I, I, I start to understand now. I understand more or less what what the, the issue. Is. Uh, I, I, yes, yes, yes. But uh, actually, there was there was quite some drive to to take a classical system which has some I don't know Hopf bifurcation or something like this, and then and then demonstrate the same uh, thing in a quantum system, which is not so obvious actually how you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yes, but but I have a. I, yeah. mm -hmm. so, thank you I for the question because this is. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I only wanted to say for the question about uh, Josephson Junction, because it's also amazing, you know, for, for us when we went through the literature, the, the more we read, the less we understood. Well, what, right, uh, but at least you can say it does work, because you can do it. It does in, work, uh, yes, and it's a clear, <laughs> clear description, how does it work. Right. Yes. Now, my, my final uh, question or comment, or is to, I don't know what they or how to call this, is actually the following. There has, there's quite some, there has been quite some, um, uh, some activity in the past 20 years or maybe even more on this so-called wretched physics. And I guess you mm -hmm. are aware of that. 
yes. uh, which is uh, uh, usually also done in the classical setting, mm -hmm. uh, but then people try to go also quantum. Uh, and But there, essentially, the question is the reverse question, which is, let's apply an AC driving and try to get a DC output, a DC something out of it. So it would be like a DC field or, or some, some kind of DC current or something like that. So you put in something from outside, uh, which, is, which is not part of the game, which is an external AC field, let's say, which just comes from somewhere, not what you want. But then this, this something coming from uh, outside, uh, which is an AC thing, uh, will generate a DC uh, response of, of your mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hamiltonian or whatever you write down there. And this can be also, in, to some extent, taken into the quantum domain. Uh, this is, of course, all about time-dependent Hamiltonians. Uh, at yes, the end of yes, the yes. Now, in yes, some exactly. sense, it looks like uh, it's just the, the reverse question, because you want to to say, uh, to have a system where you have a DC input and uh, you want to have an AC output, so to say, in a way. Isn't that somehow related or not? Or can you Yes, comment? I think it's very much related because I think you can get rid of this uh, external uh, driving. You can really produce uh, it's driving by safe oscillation. For example, uh, this ratchet are used in biology to describe the, the transport of molecules along some, 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 some one-dimensional structures. And for sure, they are not driven by some external uh, oscillators. Yes, the, 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 this oscillation are produced in, in the system. And I, and I think that our approach with self-oscillation can also be useful. So we are even started to work on this, but there's <laughs> not too many uh, fields. And for example, we believe that this ratchet system can explain, the ratchet system plus self-oscillation can explain the photovoltaic, uh, so-called bulk photovoltaic, so which is uh, also quite interesting topic. So. Okay, okay, very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have any other uh, questions or comments from the audience? Seems everybody is uh, happy. So in this case, uh, let us thank Professor Alitsky again. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, with this, we conclude our uh, today's uh, PCS IB.